Hey, Soraya, how's it going? All right, how about you? All right, all right. It's a tough weekend for us. It's going to be an emotional weekend, but um, it's all death and life this weekend for us. So it's a I'm tough one. You, it's, this, these are wild times. Yeah, yeah. So funeral today, um, and tomorrow we're doing a co ed um, baby shower for our 12th grandchild. So Isn't that she, something? Yeah, she's due any day now. Emma Noel. So um, she just dropped and she flipped. So she's ready to head out the exit door. So, Holy moly. Yeah. So we, we've been telling our daughter-in-law, just wait till after the baby shower. So anytime after Sunday, <laughs> let Emma loose. Well, you need to tell Emma that. You need to, <laughs> excuse me. God you need to you. get real close to her tummy and say, <laughs> wait. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So today uh, we'll be talking about a band that's often connected with Paisley Underground for some reason. Um, Called, uh, in a lot of places they refer to this band as Desert Psychedelia. I think that's very adequate. Yeah, I like that description. Yeah. So the band is Thin White Rope and today we'll be talking to their lead guitar player, Roger Kunkel. Kunkel. I think that's how you pronounce his name. So Roger was with the band for pretty much the whole decade of their existence. So um, early 80s to early 90s. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking to Roger. And I think we might need a little bit of help um, well, asking some know, questions. We have, we have an additional host who, who, uh, po who, who's really useful in these situations. He's all right. He's pretty awesome. Yeah, Ronnie Barnett. <laughs> yes yes so we're gonna have uh, our friend ronnie barnett join us and yes. what looks to be a really interesting discussion with roger so let's get started hi this is soraya and this is jeff our podcast is called paisley stage raspberry and rhyme a podcast where the two of us play music that we like and share anecdotes and background about the tune we hope you'll join our conversation and without further ado agrubiar let's get groovy all right soraya so today we as we talked about in our intro we're very excited because we've been wanting to talk about thin white rope for quite a while because uh, as we mentioned thin white rope comes up in discussions quite a bit and although we primarily focus on the paisley underground we, we try to branch off a little bit and um, talk about music that's related in some way or another and thin white rope, rope thin white rope is certainly related um just as a way of introduction the way that I came to Thin White Rope was actually partially due to the Paisley Underground. Um, of course, I loved the three o'clock and the first two records were out on Frontier. So when I was flipping through records in my independent section, which was the section I would always go to at uh, Lose Records in Encinitas, California, I came across this record right here, Exploring the Axis, and I saw the Frontier label and I thought, hey, maybe they sound like the three o'clock, which they don't <laughs> at all. <laughs> but um, because of that label connection um, was the reason that I got into them. And I absolutely fell in love. So today we're speaking to Roger, who was the lead guitarist and songwriter and uh, background vocalist um, for Thin White Rope. So welcome, Roger. And thank you for joining us today. Hi. Oh, thanks for having me. Um excited to be here. So it was about um, a decade that the band existed from the early 80s to the early 90s. And from our understanding, um, the band started off with Guy and Joseph Becker, um, who we've talked to his sister Nan on the show and her connection with Game Theory. So we understand that those two guys put out an ad. Is that correct? And you answered the ad and that's how you joined the band? Uh, yeah, uh, well, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, there's a music store in Sacramento uh, called Skip's Music. So I, I was living in Sacramento at the time. Um, okay. I went to high school in, in Vacaville, which is not far from here, uh, and went to college in Sacramento. And I was just, in, you know, wanting to, to get into a band. I, I wasn't even that interested in going to college at first. I just wanted to go somewhere and, and, 
you know, was interested in getting bands. So they had, you know, back then they had a bulletin board at the music sh shop and, and, you know, well, instrument shop and you know, people would, would put up little adverts for trying to, trying to put a band together. And usually, you know, they, you'd list uh, the influences, you know, who you're into and stuff. And, and um, so, yeah, I put up a, uh, something there and I think Joe had put something up or Kevin or I forget if it was Joe or Kevin I think it was Kevin uh, State of Horror that uh, I first contacted and he told me that he had spoken to somebody a drummer and a, a, a singer guitar player who was Guy and um, and so we got together and and Originally, we practiced at Kevin's house in Sacramento, so we, we were kind of a Sacramento Davis combination uh, to, to start, yeah. Just to go back a little before that, um, Roger, were you in bands in high school? I mean, uh, I was. Uh, I <laughs> um, had a band in high school uh, that was mostly like hard rock covers and stuff, and then we um, we'd play at the local parties and dances and things like that. And uh, actually a little bit in Sacramento and, and Davis and, and we were like 16. Um, and uh, that band, uh, uh, I had mentioned in a, in a thread earlier that Steve Packenham, who ended up in True West for a while was the drummer of that band. Oh, wow. And what was the name of this band? And what, <laughs> what, what were the cover songs you were playing? Just the some band was called Amperage. No. Nice. And so, nice. kind of, you know, and uh, we started out with like that typical hard rock, you know, cover material that kids are still playing today. I noticed, you know, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> CDC, and Black Sabbath, and and stuff like that. But then at the same time, um, like half of the band was discovering punk rock, and the other half was like leaning towards metal. And so we were this weird combination where we we play uh, Ramones and Black Sabbath back to back. I guess maybe <laughs> that's not so weird, but um, and we had a, actually had a few original tunes too, um, and we're pretty decent, you know, high school band. Uh, <laughs> but then things fell apart because uh, you know of the the artistic differences, you know, within uh, <laughs> within the group. Nice, nice. So I got to ask, when, when Thin White wrote, when you first met Guy, I mean, Guy, let's face it, has a very distinctive vocal style. Um, was that, what was the Thin White Rope sound kind of there from the beginning or did, uh, did, he, did that develop? Did he develop his vocal style over his, a little bit? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. And, and I'll back up and say that, you know, Guy was really, you know, uh, the primary uh, songwriter, you know, of Thin White Rope. Uh, uh, the songwriting credits on the records are just sort of like for, you know, some musical, com you know, uh, co contributions. You know, uh, Thin White Rope was essentially the Guy Kaiser band um, for the most part. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we first, when we first started practicing, um, uh, yeah, Joe said, I, I, I play with this guy named Guy that uh, uh, writes songs and stuff. And so we started playing some of his songs. And at, at first I was a little taken aback because he, he sang in this like really like low, uh, wavery, deep voice. And, and it took a while to develop to what you hear on the records. Um, and I remember doing the first demo and he, you know, and there's that awkward thing where the singer has got the headphones on and you just hear the singing. <laughs> his voice is kind of bizarre really, but uh, it didn't take long before it, you know, it was, it was obvious that this was a person who uh, was, you know, very original, very, you know, gifted songwriter and, uh, and had, if anything, uh, you know, a, a unique voice. And so that works. And, um, and yeah, eventually over time, he sort of physically developed his voice into this bigger gravelly thing, you know, that could scream and, and scare people. Yeah, you, you can kind of hear the development on that first album, because like, I'd say half the album is kind of, dare, dare I say, pop songs. And then half is kind of a thin white rope, you know, kind of 
uh, I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, Thin White Rope. I mean, no band sounds like Thin White Rope. Let's face it. Yeah, um, his yeah. voice was emerging. Yeah. Soraya, yeah. what was the the definition that or the description that you often hear? Okay, so that what the Desert Psychedelia or the one that I it says Thin. This is from an article from 2016. Thin White Rope were too harsh to be labeled as jangle, too loud for the emerging alternative country movement, and too dark to fit into the flowery paisley underground yeah but you know it guy's voice is unique but the sound ronnie you hit it on the nose no band sounds like thin white rope no i not only vocally i think musically as well i there's like a, a sinister feel or a dark feel but still pop it's like a dark pop i guess <laughs> as is how i would describe it but yeah there's nobody sounds like thin white rope well yeah uh, We'll get to the yeah guitar interplay, Roger. I mean, right. with you and your guy. I mean, um, it's unbelievable. You know, I hate, I, I don't want to mention television, but you know, I'm sure you got television comparisons because uh, you know you guys play yeah. off each other. And uh, did that just kind of happen naturally, or did you was it a conscious effort to make it happen? Well, I think we both. <laughs> well, television was an influence for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had some common influences going into it. Uh, uh, like we both liked old blues and and uh, country music. Um, I was kind of raised. Uh, my 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 parents were listened to country music, sort of the slick country music of the nineteen sixties. You know, like Patsy Cline and Jim Reeves and stuff like that. But I discovered some. Uh, Chet Atkins records when I was a kid and that's what got me really started on guitar and then you know I was in the right age where the whole uh, hard rock you know thing happened with heavy guitar sounds and so I was really into you know a heavy distorted fuzz tone guitar and and stuff like that and uh, and of course most kids playing guitar at that time I guess were um, and uh, so I don't know, uh, it, did it start right away? Kind of, uh, you know, Guy was doing some like, you know, some uh, un unorthodox stuff. You know, he's he's got that, he had that uh, Ovation Breadwinner guitar and he was like plugged into this solid state Marshall amp with, uh, I forget what fuzz tone he was using at the time. Um, and it, it took a while to, I mean, we both wanted to play lead guitar of course, and um, yeah, I think at first I, I I I tried to just do like interesting rhythmic stuff, rhythm guitar parts and stuff, and 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 over time it sort of evolved into this, you know, try to uh, orchestrate you know more guitars together and stuff, and then in the later years we were really getting into you know harmonizing and and doing feedback simultaneously and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, um, I think just the, the, we, we, we like that sound and te television was an influence, uh, but, you know, we did more of the, you know, long, uh, sustained singing feedback, things like that, you know, we, we so we both sort of like strategized on, on the blending of the guitars like we even so much as to choosing amplifiers that would complement each other. Like I typically used a Fender amp and guy would use a Marshall. Um, we were both playing Fender guitars, but um, you know, just tried to make sure that the guitars created a space, a, a, you know, a, a spacious combined sound. Um, and, but once in a while, you know, stuck to the rhythm and lead formula that's that's typical right I, I was lucky enough to see uh you guys like four or five times and um i mean live uh, of course you can hear that on the records but live i mean it was really special and unbelievable um to watch roger so um ronnie were those shows in texas or here in california yeah i saw i saw the band twice in in texas at a club called fitzgerald i'm from houston and um oh yeah then, that that place was great. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh yeah. they tore that down, Roger. Um that, that old That's house sad. it had been there for a hundred years. They tore it down. But um Yeah, and we would stay. We had Thanksgiving there once. So it was great. Oh yeah, yeah. They had the behind the 
the band yeah. house. Yes, exactly. And then um, when I first moved to California, 89, I saw you um, with American Music Club at Bogarts and Club Lingerie. That was right when the RCA deal uh, mm. happened, I believe. Uh, so Sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the major label thing. But, uh, <laughs> I have a, a question about the band's name. So it's it's well known that the band's name um, was from the William S. Burrow book, Naked Lunch, and uh, the description of the male ejaculate. So is that something that the whole bit, Ronnie, you look surprised? <laughs> yeah, that's, I didn't say it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but uh, so did the, did the entire band agree to that name or? Well, we had to agree, agree to it at some point, but uh, yeah, um, <laughs> it was... Um, Friend, a friend of the band suggested it, um, and uh, we were all crazy about Bill Burroughs at the time, and and uh, so uh, yeah, um, I can't think of there if there were many there if there were many alternatives in play. Um, uh, it's kind of it, it turned out to be awkward, and you know, <laughs> in more ways than one. Uh, <laughs> You, like on our first tour like it seemed like almost every other night the, the club would get it wrong and write it as thin white line you know some reference oh. to cocaine or something <laughs> an entirely um, different oh. different yeah. thing yeah. yeah and you know and then it's always awkward when you know like when your parents start reading reviews and stuff and you know so <laughs> see that but um, well yeah and every interview is asking where'd you get the band name or you know yeah yeah it's like you know on <laughs> apple music it's like the first thing they say in the description of the band you know so, so it's hard to get away from it yeah but you know, metaphorically it, it it's a strong you know strong metaphor for you know the, the tenuous connections between that we form between people and the consequences of such connections and intended or otherwise you know and in yeah. and of itself, it's, it it just flows nicely. I mean, regardless of where <laughs> it came from, or, so to speak, Jeff. Yeah, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get uh, a. I'm trying to get off of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Roger, how so? How does Frontier Records find you? Find you guys? Um, well, that was interesting. Um, we uh, so um, at so let's see. It must have been '83 or or so when we were all excited thinking, you know, we were going to jump into this, you know, cool alternative music scene. Um, and uh, we knew that some bands were, you know, the, we, there was a, a guy who he was somehow involved with uh, Game Theory too, uh, Scott Vanderbilt. Uh, I think he was their manager or, or something at the time. Yeah. But, uh, he offered to manage the band and he had contacts at Enigma and a couple other, you know, indie labels. And uh, we did a demo in town here in Davis with the intention of it being an album. And, uh, and he was shopping that to labels. But at some point, uh, somebody in England got a copy of the, of the demo. And I, I, it might have been Russ, actually. It might have been uh, uh, somebody told me that they had slipped a, a cassette to somebody when they were in London. I think I, I think that um, True West was being courted by Island Records at the time, and and he, somebody I think Russ did us the favor of slipping a demo to, to someone, and it it got to a bucket full of brains. Um, the fanzine and they really liked that tape and they did a big write-up on Thin White Rope and this was before we were signed or had a record out. Wow. And that got back to Lisa. So it <laughs> so the demo went from Davis to London and back to LA uh, and wow. Lisa really liked the demo um, and at the time uh, she was uh, trying to work out a deal with Island Records, a distribution deal with Frontier and Island Records. And Island Records was uh, hot on, you know, part of the uh, the True West thing plays into this because they, they were interested in West Coast American neo-psychedelic uh, bands. Like this was the, the, you know, this was on the horizon as a big wave, you know, they were thinking this was gonna be really cool. And so they identified a few bands um, 
what they were interested in. And the idea was that it, they'd be signed to Frontier, but licensed to uh, Island. And so uh, Lisa contact, uh, got a hold of us and said, you know, we want to sign you. Uh, and she had to buy out because we had already signed a management contract with uh, Scott and um, she had to buy that out, but she had money. She was willing to spend money because Island was talk, was throwing a lot of money around, I guess. Um, so it was us and the long riders and uh, uh, Rain Parade. Maybe Rain Parade. Yeah, it was part of the, was part of it. But there's like this few bands that were going to be part of this deal. Oh. Um, and so we, and that's why the first record we made was done in a, in an expensive professional studio because there was money. Uh, but then in the end, Island pulled out of that deal and went with long riders only, I think. Um, and so Lisa got held, uh, you know, ended up having to, <laughs> having to pay the bill for all this stuff. Or well, eventually, eventually we did, I guess. But um, yeah, so it was all kind of a whirlwind and, and roundabout strangeness that we finally ended up uh, getting our first album. Okay. Not like a passion. Yeah, I'd noticed that about the first record, like mixed it Ocean Way, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it was actually, you know, engineered by Dennis Dragon. Yeah. Uh, famously, Daryl Dragon, the captain's uh, brother. Uh, yes. Captain and Tennille. So there's a Captain and Tennille thin white rope connection. <laughs> there yeah. you go. Right. Uh, and he tragically passed away not too long ago. I noticed uh, an article about. Uh, and Jeff yeah. Eirich, uh, both of those guys were, if you remember, the surf punks with this yes. LA sort of, you know, surfer dude punk band. Um, and uh, yeah, point, uh, Dennis Dragon lived in this house uh, in Malibu uh, that had, uh, he had a mobile uh, set up in this truck parked outside the house and then in the basement was this studio space. Wow. That's where we recorded that first album. And it was all like fantastic to us because we had just been used to, you know, typical, you know, local scene and, and uh, you know, recording on crappy eight tracks and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, um, that record was, was an experience. When we were done with it, we didn't like it because it didn't sound like we sounded live. Oh, um, how, how is time, it different? Um, well, I don't know, just the big production on everything. And, and we were a little stilted in our playing and, and such, um, you know, it felt a little stiff. Uh, it didn't, it didn't sound as, as, as loose and, and free flowing as we were used to, but in, in retrospect, uh, yeah, I think it sounds really, it's an interesting sounding record. Yeah. Well, well, the next record, uh, Moonhead is where all that came together, right? Yeah, Moonhead was where, so we, with Moonhead, we, we went to uh, 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 this guy, Paul McKenna, who was an uh, engineer for uh, A&M uh, Records, uh, had his own studio, and we were, so, he'd take on, you know, small projects, indie projects, if he liked the band or whatever, and um, it was also, you know, super nice little studio, though, but we were much more, like, you know, comfortable and and involved in the production and stuff on that one and and 
the moon head sounded like we wanted to sound. Yeah, and, and you toured a lot between records. Right? I mean, you, you, like I said, I saw you a couple times. You guys seem to tour a whole lot um, during these frontier years. Um, well, the first tour, <laughs> uh, the first tour was kind of infamous, uh, and it was a combined like lease. Once again, there were other players in, involved, and and so. Uh, spin uh, spin radio underground uh, from spin oh, yeah. magazine andrea anthal uh, she was like really high on the band and other frontier acts and stuff and so our first tour was semi-sponsored by spin magazine and um and it was three bands at once it was us and the pontiac brothers and naked prey and uh it was dubbed the good the bad and the ugly tour that's right <laughs> we did hear about that right uh, and we rotated headliner but but and it was all well and good because it, it was like it was cool that spin magazine was was advertising it and stuff and and that got us booked into larger places than we should have been booked into because nobody had heard of these bands before so you know people didn't flock to the clubs just because spin magazine says you know <laughs> check out this new tour and so we had some bad uh nights like uh showing up at first avenue in in minneapolis yeah. to a completely empty house oh you know yeah where we it's should a big been, we should have yeah. been in the side street entry right yes uh, instead yeah. of, instead <laughs> of big and we'd be lucky to be there even in fact the next time we came through we we're in the side street en entry and then in boston they booked us in some weird big place and Billy Gibbons was the only guy who sh showed up. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> just a coincidental. But they canceled the show. We didn't pay, play it. We didn't get to play. Oh. Billy Gibbons. But yeah, this limo shows up, and it turns out ZZ Top's playing in town, and they're and he's like out on the town to see what's happening. Uh, but yeah, they canceled the show because nobody showed up. You know, and, wow. And so most of our shows were on that first tour were. Some of them were fun. Some were disastrous, and. Um, but it was an interesting trip. So well, that was like a real tour, you know, five week tour or something. And, and but then after Moonhead came out is when we started touring um, uh, on our own and, and yeah, a lot. Yeah, we, especially once we started going to Europe, we, we were touring like uh, probably s seven months out of the year or something for the next six or seven years. Nice. We, we should also, also mention there's a Spin Records, uh, there's a live Thin White Rub show, like a radio show that exists on vinyl that uh, mm -hmm. people should find if they can. Because uh, oh, that's the Spin Radio Underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. have I have one of those. Uh, oh, you have that, Ronnie? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I don't own that. Nice. I uh, encourage people to find it. But a uh, good thing Spin was sponsoring that tour, Roger, because those canceled shows, I mean, that would have been a yeah. disaster for an independent oh. tour right like yeah. it, you know you know it was uh it, yeah it was uh pack every you know well all of our tours were just shove everything into a, a van and and uh live on, on i remember it was ridiculous because it was set up as if it was a big deal tour we had laminates you know nice. and um uh, Nice. And the tour, there was a tour manager guy, and he told us like we were going to be in big trouble if we play if we traded our laminates for sexual favors. He didn't phrase oh. it like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and then we got seven. We each got seven dollars a day to to eat lunch with or something. Oh, wow, legit tour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Roger, you alluded to this earlier, but um, the title track "Moonhead." You've got a songwriting credit, so. Um, and then uh, we didn't mention Real West on on the debut album. You also got a songwriting credit. So is this more of a guy brings in these songs and you add you add something? Yeah, to it, essentially, or? you know, uh, you know, just I mean, there's a lot of instrumental. There's a long instrumental section in the, in that song, you know. Uh, so I, you know, it's just sort of a. <sighs> You know, de musically developing the tune that guy would start with yeah i think that tune he had actually had written that tune like years earlier moonhead yeah okay so the the songwriting process was pretty much guy bringing in bringing in the songs to the band and you guys would yeah. work out your parts and so pretty would much. he would he um suggest what you should play or you would come up with your own parts 
Uh, mostly my own. Sometimes he would. <laughs> at some point, he got himself a four-track cassette, and so he'd he'd come out of his little you know home studio laboratory with a bunch of stuff on there, and I'd be all like, oh man. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'd rather invent my own part. But once in a while, you know, I mean, there'd be some parts on there. It's like, oh, that's like really, you know, freaking cool. I, I guess I'll play that part. So <clears throat> that would vary too. Um, you know, he, he is, guy is, he's definitely a, a uh, you know, composer. He's, a, you know, he's a, uh, he's a poet. He's a composer. He's a guitar player. He's a singer. He's like the whole package, you know. And, um, Kind of a control freak too but you know <laughs> the whole band would uh, uh you know obviously makes an impact and, and it would vary from song to song roger there's a show um on youtube from the, uh, the cattle club i believe where guy is playing naked right. um, <laughs> what is the story with that i've always wondered what is the uh, story with that that show was at a warehouse in davis okay. uh that we called the olive pit it's on Olive Drive in Davis, and it was also a rehearsal space for some bands. But we'd have, uh, for a while, we had some shows and parties there. Um, it was <laughs> it was a bet. It it was uh, somebody okay. offered guy like forty dollars to play naked. <laughs> and, uh, he took them up on it. So cowboy boots and and Telecaster oh. slung down low. Um, the whole set. The whole yeah the whole wow set. okay um and He's the original one, naked cowboy one thing that's funny about that is that uh at the time that happened you know there was no youtube yeah and youtube started getting uh, uh popular in the 90s i guess and sure enough thin white rope stuff starts showing up but that's the first thing <laughs> that, that that someone posted uh, about thin white rope and since and for years uh yeah or mostly and so for years like if you googled thin white rope that would be the top item right you know, so, <laughs> so i just thought it was hilarious that you know 10 years later uh you know if guy go if guy's on a computer and and goes to thin white rope he sees yeah. himself naked so you know, <laughs> it's pretty funny so that was just a one-time thing not something that happened <clears throat> Often. One time, yeah, definitely a one-time thing. Yeah, that yeah, didn't become his uh yeah. his, his thing. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's a good recording of that show, um, and, or, or there were two. I think there were two, and someone actually had a a, a four-track reel-to-reel uh, recording going for that show. I think there's a True West. There was one where True West played on the bill of one of those. I get them mixed up, so I'm not sure if it was that night or a, a different one, but. And a friend of ours is uh, interested in in mastering that and putting it out. It's a it's a good live hmm. recording. Yes, nice. wonderful. Um, okay, so after Moonhead, uh, Roger, you start having some lineup changes. Um, jo Joseph leaves, and you get a new bass player. Um, uh, I think maybe you had two more bass players. Am I am I right on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Steve Teslick, uh, who played on the first two records. Um, uh, left the band after that. He was kind of frustrated because he was actually a guitar player uh, playing bass. And he contributed a lot. I mean, there's some yeah. like really great bass lines that that he contributed. And, Definitely. and, you know, we had just finished making Moonhead and it turned out so well. And we were really excited about it. And then he told us that he was leaving. And uh, so that I was kind of shocked. Um, and uh, John Von Felt replaced him and John Van Felt was from uh, Denver originally, but he was living in LA and playing in, in uh, a couple bands around there. I can't remember exactly how we made contact with him. I think Lisa Fancher was trying to put the word out in various ways. Um, and uh, he came out, he actually moved to Davis and uh, joined the band and did, did tons of touring with us. Uh, he and Joe Becker didn't get along, uh, and on tour, things kind of started to disintegrate at, at one point, um, and we decided we needed to, uh, Joe was having trouble uh, 
in his in the band and and on tour and and stuff and so we decided to replace joe and found uh matt Aberisk, who had was also an la area drummer and, uh, and photographer um and uh he was like his style was different than joe's he was very powerful you know uh it, and it really sort of pushed our live shows into another level of volume and and energy and stuff so that was good um but joe and john both are on the recording right of in the spanish cave uh let's see um that's the third record yep. uh yeah joe and john are on that yeah the record were they was it were they okay in the studio to record yeah. this album yeah yeah, yeah there, there was just like the pressures of touring i i think um yeah it, it's it was we it's it's funny guys guy and i were very much conscious of the the fact that you know turnover in a band is not a good thing <laughs> you know <laughs> you don't have that you know cohesive thing where you're like ah oh, we're all in this together and we've been doing it since we were kids you know sort of thing. <laughs> um so it was uh, I, I don't know if i'd say regrettable but yeah i mean i i do wish that we had managed to keep the original unit together um in retrospect um, yeah but you well know, like like okay. you say it's, it's hard to tour you know you guys are in a van and you're probably sharing one hotel room and yeah if that yeah yeah <laughs> you know that you know that feeling <laughs> yeah 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 did you uh did you guys share beds like in one hotel room who was your who oh, was he, your bed mate yeah you had to either share beds or, or take turns on the floor you know and, <laughs> and a lot of times the floor of a of a motel six is not a place you want to lay down yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep that in mind yeah. soraya and joe <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very glamorous. So, uh, well, you know, touring in Europe was much better. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, we were treated with respect in Europe. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> in that we got hotel proper hotel rooms, and 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 meals, and yeah. So we loved. Uh, we enjoyed Europe a lot more uh, than than the states, just because it was just you know, it was more comfortable. It was more exotic. It was the food was better. And, you know, right enthusiastic and that shows were bigger and all that stuff. Roger, did you do multiple tours in Europe? Yeah, we toured quite a lot. Um, probably we'd, we'd go to, between Moonhead and the end of the band, we'd go to Europe at least twice a year and usually for like three months at a time or so. Wow. Um, and uh, it started with, uh, with well, a Moonhead record had come out and uh, uh, suddenly, Lisa calls us and says, "There's a guy in Italy that wants to bring you to Italy," and uh, we had, you know, before we had ever we had been to Europe at all, and so we were like excited about that prospect. And we we did a week long trip in Italy, and when we got there, we discovered that we were rock stars in Italy, and like the record was had like getting lots of radio play. Wow! And. Uh, and we found ourselves on a bill with X and Billy Bragg. Wow. Um, and 10,000 Maniacs at this like big outdoor festival. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah. And we played in, in like public parks with several thousand people and stuff. And so this was a big shock for us. And, um, and so the Italian promoter who booked the tour continued to work with us. And he said, well, I'll bring you over again for a prop for an actual European tour. But that was like, it was like us packed into a Vanagon, a Volkswagen Vanagon yes. with tiny little amplifiers. <laughs> yes. And uh, we made it into Germany and all the way into Norway and, and stuff. And, and, uh, and that, that was our first experiences in Europe. And then, um, 
we find we made it we, we didn't make it to england until like the third time over um and then we started being booked by paperclip out of uh holland and uh and then there was the soviet tour which well, was this bizarre uh, uh circumstance that um deserves talking about <laughs> yeah know. yeah yeah <laughs> we're ready how many, how many dates was that and, and what kind of vehicle and uh, accommodations uh were going on there how much time do we have let's see um <laughs> it was so the italian the, the italian promoter uh paolo bedini uh in rome uh was friendly friendly with uh friends of his worked in the sort of ministry of arts of italy or something and they they were involved in some sort of uh, cultural exchange with with russia with moscow where some uh, uh, Russian artists and musicians had come to Rome and performed and stuff, and then they were going to reciprocate and, and send Italians to to uh, to uh, Russia. And uh, so Paolo decided to to hijack this process and put us in the mix. <laughs> and um, even though we we're an American band, and um, so he arranged this and uh we were there for like three weeks um we flew to moscow um the russians were somewhat surprised that a a rock band from america was was in the, in the mix and they were looking at our passports and squinting and we stayed in some weird hotel and we played at this like theater with like high society folks in the audience with like minks on and stuff and and um it was on it was broadcast on soviet national television and it was all quite surreal and then they put us on a train um this rickety wooden train that uh went down to uh tbilisi georgia and we played at the uh, opera house of tbilisi georgia for like four nights in a row uh, to a packed audience through the strangest PA ever made and <laughs> Polish amplifiers and and uh, and then the Armenian earthquake hit and shook the whole town and and we were stuck there for a few days and then we flew to Lithuania and played in Vilnius and uh, Kraunas and uh, um, and finally got back to uh, Rome and it was all qu quite strange and but really you know fun um, and uh, we by the time we got back to Rome we 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 they kept us there like a, a week or two longer than they said it was going to be and so all of our flights were were gone and it was almost Christmas it was 1988 and um, we got uh, uh, we find we had we were stuck in Rome and because we couldn't find a flight home and then we finally got booked on Pan Am 103, and we were all set to go um, when um, we could not find a connection from, this Pan Am 103 was going to New York and we needed a connection to San Francisco and we couldn't find one, so we canceled our reservations at the last minute. <laughs> so it, it was a very crazy trip and we finally wow. made it home from, from that. Uh, thought we were gonna die numerous times. Guy almost got arrested by the Moscow police for urinating in public. Um, <laughs> we we had this incredible. We had this evening in in Tbilisi where the locals like had us over for dinner, and we were already way too drunk on this strange green vodka that they that they like make in the underground on the black market, and they had us in this super traditional dinner that was all very nice, but it but it involved um, toasting with a giant horn filled with wine. You had, you had to get up and make a toast and like chug the entire horn of wine, which was like a bottle <laughs> of wine. Wow. And we were already way too drunk and everybody started vomiting and, <laughs> it, and chaos and soon and people like ran and, you know, panicked and ran. And um, it, was, it was a very strange trip. Wow. Yeah, and we oh and we found ourselves in weird places like that. We also went to Hungary and uh, Budapest, and this was all, you know, during the Soviet era. And, wow. Uh, so it was pretty strange.
What an experience. A lot of fun. Yeah. And then we, you know, we tried to concentrate on Germany and England and Scandinavia after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, man, I can't, I, I'm having a hard time recovering from that. Right now, so. <laughs> that's the condensed, that's the highly I, conven- condensed I, version. I feel like I'm, yeah. I feel like I'm on the, I was on the tour and I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, Probably okay, so, more. yeah. Okay, so uh, the RCA deal happens now. Um, how, how does that affect you or does it at all? Are you still dealing with just Frontier and then mm-hmm. they're just distributing, RCA is just distributing the records? Yeah, uh, mostly. Um, RCA was uh, pretty hands off. And uh, I'd, I'd say, if anything, it was a negative because, um, you know, at that time, most. Uh, 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 self-respecting, uh, you know, indie underground band bands were very anti uh, uh, big label, you know, uh, including the distributors like uh, Rough Trade in uh, in Europe. Uh, essentially, did not carry uh, major label uh, material. Like in in Germany, they, it was like the you know mark of the beast, and you got you know <clears throat> you got pushed aside. So we ended up selling uh, less. Uh, in in Europe than we did on the previous uh, record, I think. Um, so and they didn't they they didn't really do us m- many favors as far as like you know infusing a bunch of money for for advertising or uh, you know other promotion and stuff. It was just you know we got you know got the got to say hey I'm on a major label, um, but um, yeah and it 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 didn't really affect us very much and and we actually were spending less on our recording you know the the fourth album was recorded with tom mallon in san francisco um and in his uh studio which was less expensive than what we had been doing yeah that's a sack full of silver 1990. And that sort of grew out of our relationship with American Music Club. You know, we'd become, you know, friends with those guys on label mates and played a lot of shows together. And and uh, uh, Tom was uh, uh, just a really gifted uh, engineer and recordist. And I, I really like that record. That that record. I don't know if it's my favorite, but I I was really happy with how it came out. Roger, mm. your your one co-write on the album has an odd name. It's not even really a name. It's a it's a, it's a shape. Yeah. <laughs> the, the triangle song. So yes. uh, why the triangle song? Uh, why did I get the co-write? Uh, just you know, I I think you know, like I say, guy, you know, obviously it was a it's a Guy Kaiser song, uh, and it was just sort of a matter of like, oh, you know, which song did Roger? contribute you know most to oh, okay in this batch you know sort of thing so is he throwing you a bone yeah pretty much <laughs> i'd say it, do you but, i mean uh, you know uh, just just like i say it, it was kind of the guy kaiser band uh, as far as that goes um uh, obviously you know we were all proud of our contributions musically <laughs> Yeah, but it was a bit arbitrary. The songwriting credits because it was more like you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna have a blanket, you know, Guy Kaiser only, you know, uh, songwriting right. credits. Yeah. Understood. We we should mention that's before Prince. You having that just symbol, you know? Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's uh, you were ahead of the. I, I don't know. Yeah, I figured <laughs> what year he did that. Um, but yeah, I, I like that lyric a lot. Um, 
you know, I'm kind of a sucker for guys, more poetic lyrics, you know, he'd really get in these landscape, you know, geography driven, you know, uh, lyrics yeah. and stuff, really nice, uh, really nice stuff. Um, so, so, uh, I guess we're to the kind of the, the end, like how, how, how does the band kind of decide to break up or does it just kind of fall apart yeah. or, yeah, we have one more record. Yet there, yeah. But. Well, I think, I think guy, you know, guy was, um, and I want, I don't want to speak too much for him, but essentially, yeah. you know, guy was a very, is a very private, uh, introverted person, uh, and, being a front man of a rock and roll band was uh, difficult for him, just emotionally, and you know, uh, and he was kind of struggling with it, and um, infusing uh, himself with a lot of uh, alcohol, and and you know, to he, like every show, he'd he'd have to sort of like get into a state of mind that was very taxing for him you know and yeah. and um and then there were some personal things going on not so much between us uh but uh uh love life things uh and um triangle song is a good thing <laughs> uh and um so I, at some point you know he started a new uh, relationship and he was frustrated he, he was definitely frustrated that the band wasn't more successful uh, and felt like the American tours you know we were doing the same thing every time or you know playing the same same places so there was some frustration with that with that it had been 10 years you know it's a long time yeah. And he just he just did a uh, a really significant uh, shift, you know, in his life. He wanted to change things up quite a lot, and so he just called me up one day and said he was quitting the band. And I said, "Well, that's inconvenient. <laughs> 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 you know, if you quit, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> that pretty much ends the band." Um, so yeah, um, he just decided to call it quits, and then so the final tour. Um, I, I managed to talk him into doing the, the final tour. Um, and of course we did a live album of the yeah. final show and that's the, the one that got away that, that record. And so I'm really happy that it, uh, that happened because uh, I, yeah. you know, that, that live record is, is the band at that point and like everything we had come to as far as our live performance goes. And it really sound it really sounds like how the band sounded live, and it's two hours, you know, plus of plowing through all the material. So, so Roger, the understanding was that that was going to be the final tour. You knew it. Yeah, it, yeah, it was all preconceived, you know, as a as a final tour. We it was a short tour in June. Uh, I turned thirty. We played and we played a, uh, at uh, Ruskelder. Uh, in uh denmark denmark and the reading festival so this was 91 or 92 92 92 by okay. that time i think yeah 92 okay. um uh yeah so it was just like a couple of weeks of some good good gigs and um and then that culminating show in belgium where we, where we did the recording so that had to have oh, been it, it was nice to be able to plan plan the whole ending of it you know? yeah yeah no, hey, it's quite a career, Roger. I mean, 10 years, five albums, uh, EP, compilation, double live album. I mean, uh, yeah, all the, you know, it's amazing. And, and a fantastic discography. I mean, the entire discography is great. And then Frontier decides to reissue it on 180 gram. And my buddy Paul Dubray ma mastered it and did a masterful <laughs> job of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how, are, uh, were, you, were you pleased with the reissue campaign? Yeah, and of course, the most important thing is the colors. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> two different colors. Two different two different of each colors. title. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I think they sound really good. Um, and it, it was uh, in the 80s, and I don't want to rag on Rainbow uh, Records, but but I was always frustrated with the quality because our test pressings would always sound better than the than the product. Okay. And uh, and some of the product was not that good, and uh, you know, and you know, maybe I was you know expecting too much, like you know, Japanese master pressings or something. <laughs> um, uh, but this is better, you know. This is a, you know, it's a better quality vinyl. It's a better pressing. It's uh, you know, and, and the mastering sounds great. Um, I can hear a lot of. I definitely can hear a lot of detail and it's fun it's fun to listen to the records with that much detail because it's it sparks memories of actually recording this stuff you know? nice it's like oh yeah we got about that little part you know nice sort of thing so yeah i was happy that that lisa decided to do that so roger i'm a vinyl nerd i love vinyl records and i have a couple walls of record albums and typically i like to go for the original pressings but I'm definitely going to recommend if anybody is not familiar with Thin White Rope and you're going to in, invest some money, go with the reissues on, on in in this case. Typically, I say go with the original pressing, yeah. but in this mm -hmm. case, yeah, the the remastered versions are fantastic. No, and they're highly afford. They're like sixteen bucks. Like yeah, they're, they're sixteen they're, bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> highly affordable in this day and age. So. Yeah. And Roger, you continue to play music. Um, it's not like Thin White Rope, but uh, yeah. you know, just tell us just yeah, a little bit different. about what. You, yeah, what you do now? Yeah, well, you know, after the after the band broke up, I wanted to do something totally different. So I, I, I had a band in the '90s called the Acme Rocket Quartet, and it was an instrumental uh, four piece, surprisingly, and uh, mostly my music, but sort of a collaboration, um, kind of surf, jazz, rock, hybrid of stuff, and. Uh, we made three we made three CDs and it was all I got into recording I bought some basic equipment and an a track and I did all the recording myself I I sold off my solid body guitars and just got an old, a crappy old uh, arch top and uh, did like this pseudo jazz uh, stuff we, we sort of got lumped into the lounge the lounge scene in, in San Francisco at the time and so we played it like Bruno's and 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 uh, bimbos once and like big warehouse parties and things like that but the band didn't tour at all none of us were keen on touring at the time uh so we made we made three cds and those are on Bandcamp, uh acme rocket quartet and then so then I, I got pretty into bluegrass uh, um you know and old time and you know, it's just nice to be able to play acoustic instruments you know when you're in your house with your children and stuff um and uh and actually guy was getting guy, guy became a banjo player and we, we actually had a bluegrass band together for a while uh around 2008 or something so we did a demo I actually had had hopes that we we'd uh, pursue that but one of the one of the band members i was playing mandolin and guy was playing uh, uh banjo and I, I I do have a demo recording, but it's not super good quality. And then the guitar player moved away, and we never managed to get it back together. And then all of a sudden, guy was you know deciding he didn't want to perform uh, again. Um, and uh, recently, uh, I play in a I play in like sort of a honky tonk classic country roadhouse kind of band called Mike Blanchard and the Californios. And we sort of we do the the beer circuit basically, you know, the, <laughs> uh, all the brew pubs and stuff around the area, and that's a lot of fun. And um, I'm pursuing becoming a solo guitarist. Um, and I I made a CD that's on Bandcamp that's solo acoustic guitar. Uh, and I was just getting into getting out and performing. <laughs> during that before the lockdown so i haven't done a whole yeah. lot of that yet uh i got out just before the lockdown i i was starting to get out and play and sort of guest you know playing with people here and there and i i did a, a show with russ in la with just a couple songs actually mm. and that was fun uh and uh yeah 
So I, I'd, I'd love to get out and play more. I'm kind of envious of, you know, bands of the 80s that have, you know, reformed and are actually able to tour and, and you know, do that sort of stuff. Maybe it could still happen, Roger. Yeah. Then White Rope yeah. Reunion, maybe. Yeah, well, no one's been able to, able to convince Guy. Yeah, well, maybe. He's, it sounds like he, he goes in and out of uh, wanting to play music, so you never know. Yeah, right? who knows, yeah. yeah. So you know, yeah. Roger, as soon as he sees this episode of Paisley Stage, Raspberry and Rhyme, it's all going <laughs> to flip. It's going to be like, yes, <laughs> yes, let's do this. Yes. Okay. Expect a phone call next week. Right. <laughs> Guy's gonna be on the phone. Let's take come on, Roger. Let's take this on the road. Let's give Joe a call. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And we should tell people to join the Thin White Rope uh, fan page on Facebook because Roger will occasionally put up a uh, a clip of him playing. And uh yeah, absolutely. Roger's an amazing player. Uh so I know you're right here, Roger, but yeah, Roger is <laughs> an amazing player. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Roger, for taking time to, to walk us through uh, the history of the band. It was it, it was only a decade, but it was a very impactful um, career for the band, at least for me. It, it all started off with that seeing that Frontier label on the back mm -hmm. of Exploring the Axis, and um, yeah, but all, well, all the records are fantastic. Thank goodness for Lisa Fancher and uh, yeah. Frontier Records. Yeah, yeah, we had her on the show, and she's very supportive of the band, even to this day. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, she doesn't remaster everything. So no, 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 the no, fact no. that she did the Thin White Rope shows uh, the love there. So absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yep. Thin White Rope and Christian Death. There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Circle Jerks. Ad adolescence, yeah. I think. I adolescence. Think. Yeah. Colored, colored that's drugs. about it, though. Standard. I mean, yeah. Su suicidal tendencies. That's the, yeah. Yeah, that's. Oh, the, wait, there's a, the list is getting longer. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> it's probably only fi about five, though. It's yeah, a okay. it's a small list. So. Waiting on the choir, invisible. Uh, <laughs> probably not gonna happen <laughs> all right roger thank you so much for taking time to to chat with us we really appreciate it sure it was fun and thanks keep roger it, keep nice us posted on anything new please yes especially after you get the call from guy yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> i'll see you in davis roger i'll see you in davis i'll see you in davis okay okay Carlos, sacramento okay yep thank all you right. so much we really appreciate it all right bye 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 bye, bye. Ronnie, oh, thank you for making that gone. happen. Wow. Of course. Yeah, thanks for having me along. God, I don't mean to, be, mean to keep crashing these things, but... Uh, no, but... <laughs> thanks for having me along. Uh, oh, no. And, you know, <laughs> if, if anything, let me see. What are some of the things we learned? First of all, the walk through the five albums was really interesting to me. And Guy seems to be much more enigmatic now than when we started recording. Oh, I, yeah. I... Had, I I think just hearing a little more about him and he just seems more like a puzzle. Yeah. I'm kind of, I think it's probably a healthy move for him to step away. It sounds like to me. So we don't want like an Ian Curtis thing, right? We don't want something to happen where it's just so unhealthy for a person to do something like this. And then, um, so it, there, it sounds like there is a time for certain people to step away for their own sanity sake and maybe for guy that might be the case yeah well there's that and, and there's also the fact that he you know all his work is that the, it's intact right he didn't right. make a a weird a, you know crappy solo album or have a half-assed band that he tried to you know what i mean like it's it's he never made the elder is what you're trying to say you know he, he's he, he didn't make his elder which god now don't put it in those terms jeff we need we <laughs> we could use his elder but um yeah yes. no no you could like i was talking about seeing them live it was very guy was very intense like he wasn't he wasn't a hey thanks for coming you guys uh kind of thing um i guess you can see on a youtube and some live clips including that naked show yeah um, I, I, i've seen all of those but i never got to see them in person yeah. live so i'm and glad that you had that opportunity and were able to share your experience yeah and guys doing that that the, those intense like vibrato -y, that's guy you know the yeah you know and rod and roger generally is doing the kind of uh, dare i say clean kind of stuff behind though they, though they have their moments about doing feedback like you said and yeah it, it really was a quite a guitar team and like as you can imagine just unbelievable to watch um wow and uh yeah Soraya, that original sound right Soraya. i mean i mean no one 
But that, it's a cliche to almost say that. Like, they sound like nobody, but no, they, they, nobody sounds like Ben White, bro. But see, and then when Roger added that detail about they're even came, they came to a point of wanting to kind of create this sound together that they were finding complimentary amps. Yeah. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a <laughs> that that was a detail that I, I I don't think I could have ever imagined that they were just looking for other ways to kind of expand the sound that they created together. Yeah, I, I found that really fascinating. Smart people in a band, I know it's uh it, it doesn't usually happen that way. Um. <laughs> and I will add for anybody that um it, that thin white rope might be new to, I doubt that there's anybody of our listeners that are in that category. So I bought all of the reissues in one sitting from Lisa. And um, she said, since I bought all five, that she would give me a deal. So she gave me a great deal on all five. Ronnie, you mentioned that they're already um, well-priced, but um, yeah. she, she knocked off a lot when I bought all five of them. So I don't know if that's an option for everybody, but there's- I was gonna that. say, you might not want to publicize that. <laughs> I know, I know. But there is this too. So there is this compilation. Oh, that's right. So, so when is that Spanish only? Yeah, yeah, that's that's an import, right? Yeah, it's so it's actually put out on Frontier. Um, okay. But um, it might be a good place to start if you don't want to jump in and get all all five. So it's got something from all of their releases. So it's a when when worlds collide is might be a good place for somebody to start if they just want to start with one. But 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 if they're gonna start with one and they start with a real record, get this <laughs> Moon, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. That's the that's the. I mean, you know, I, yeah, I don't want to play favorites here. I mean, the first three are all really great. So, are yeah. any of those, any of your records signed, Ronnie? You have to see them. Multiple yeah, yeah, times. yeah. They, they are. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have them handy, but uh, yeah, my, 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 uh, my first three records are, are signed. Wow. Um, and they're very. I'm sorry, I don't have them handy. They, they, they're, they're, they're elaborately signed too. Like they, they didn't write, didn't just write a signature, you know, like I do. <laughs> and just be done with it and just be done with it yeah they, they they say funny things yeah 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 so nice oh, that's awesome very but nice. uh but uh yeah lucky enough to to have seen them and awesome. uh yeah one of my favorite bands so thanks for thanks for having me around you guys. yeah yeah we've been wanting to do this for a while yeah. and we didn't go too much into it but um as soraya had mentioned they often get thrown into this paisley underground umbrella i don't know why yeah. I, I don't uh, maybe it's the Steve Wynn connection. Maybe with the the Davis connection. Theory. It's it's a Davis connection, and, and then Joseph Beck. We we really should all talk to Joseph Becker too. Yes, uh, he's in, he's been in a lot of you know. Anyway, yep. Uh, and so that's a given. But yeah, it's a Davis thing, and these guys all played with each other. And like he said, he was in a band with uh Steve, the drummer of True West, when he was in high school. And yeah, that that Davis Sacramento um, scene back then. It was, wow, gave us gave us some great things. Yep. Yeah. And then that Island Records uh, deal yeah. that didn't pan out for all the bands. Right, right, right. But only except for Long Riders. I mean. And Rain Parade, right? Yeah. So, uh, Crashing Dream. So, yeah. There's a there's enough of links that kind of draw them in, but they don't sound like anybody. Yeah. Connected with the scene, and um, <laughs> you know, and guys' vocals are just they're yeah. just it, yeah. I, I think Roger said the unique sound, but it, it's beyond unique. It's just, it's a completely different imprint. Yeah. yeah. There, there's there's much more to Sacramento, Sacramento music than Tesla and cake. All right, everybody? <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> That's a good way to close this out. Well put, yeah. well put. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So, and I just need to point out to those of you who are audio only, you need to go see the YouTube because we've been graced the entire time by a poster of David Lee Roth doing this aerial split. In the background. <laughs> so I don't think there's any more auspicious occasion than this one. Thanks for noticing, Sarah. It's there every time, but maybe it's more noticeable sometimes. And again, uh, I... I completely noticed it today. <laughs> I usually right. see something different, but anyway. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for this movement too that it happens, but whatever. Hey, it's, it's okay. kind of fun. I, it's not my. I'm not doing it. So um, it's fun. yeah. It, but it's, yeah, it's, this was great. And Ronnie, we can't thank you enough. Absolutely. No, no, no. In all thank seriousness, you. thank you, Ronnie. Really, no, no. really appreciate it.
Thank you guys. And um, <laughs> so Ronnie, do you yeah. have a, a sign off for us today? Uh, 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 I, I, <laughs> no, no, that works. <laughs> yeah, All right, that's Soraya. my sign off. All right, y'all. I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Jeff, this was a really good episode, and I can't thank Ro uh, Roger Conkle for coming on. Yep. yep. Uh, I can't Absolutely. thank him enough. Yeah, I totally. That agree. was really yeah. good, and thank you again to Ronnie Barnett. Absolutely. Yep. Woo! All right, Jeff. I think we need to just end it right here. If we don't, I'm going to be urinating in the streets. <laughs> don't do it. Triangle song, everybody. You need it. I'm going to be out of my hands. Groove home, basically, people. <laughs>